I'm sitting there, see, it's about, uh, great Scott, I don't know what time it was, come to think of it now. You know, it's getting to the point now where all the tapes and all the films and all the novels and all the newspapers and all the magazines and all the manifestos and all the speeches and all the tirades are beginning to assume a shape of an endless, endless ribbon going on and on and on and on. You can't separate one from the other. Now, I don't quite know what time it was that John Garfield suddenly popped up on the late, 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 late show number four. Now, the thing about Garfield, you never know when the truth is going to come out and hit you in the face like a dish rag. And uh, you just never know. You, know you, you think you're going to get it in the editorial columns. And you know what you get in the editorial columns. Somebody's being bugged by the post office inefficiency or somebody's saying they ought, to, they ought to mow Vietnam entirely with a great big lawnmower and just get rid of those jungles and the people and start all over and start a golf course or something. And the thing is that the truth suddenly came out. See, I'm sitting there watching, and John Garfield shows up on the screen. Now, this movie was obviously made in the 30s because the chick in the movie was always driving around in a 1936 Chevrolet Roadster, which is a very rare car. It was a two-seater Chevrolet, 1936. Very interesting machine. And she's driving around in the mud. And it was real mud. That's what made it great because it was all over her. And that was the 30s, you see, where they, they you know, it was just the life was out. Then you took pictures of it. It wasn't very different. You didn't package it. So she's driving around in the mud, and she meets Garfield. Well, now, the thing about it, the, the, the movie opened up. To begin with, the premise was entirely foreign to any kind of premise that could be done in a movie today. It opened up, and there's a bunch of guys sitting around on the ground. It's night. And the, 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 oh, the titles, oh, another thing is very important. The titles took less than 30 seconds to get over with. So you knew it was an old movie. Uh, I know some titles now that have lapped themselves all the way over into the third reel. just keeps going on and on and on. In fact, I'm really looking for the day when there's going to be a movie that's nothing but titles. And there's going to be all these cameos of the stars. And now Ingrid Bergman. I know she comes. Everybody cheers. And uh, she has a hat on or something. And now Cary Grant. He shows up as a cowboy. Everybody cheers. This will go on and on. This will be the final end product of all. And then there will be a long shot of the atom bomb, which will make it, of course, a social documentary. <laughs> Excuse me. But on the other hand, you know, oh, yes, you mentioned the, so you mentioned, you mentioned the atom bomb in certain circles now, and you're mentioning a kind of a god. It's a thing in which, uh, well, it's a thing, really, literally, that could be used as a double-edged sword, as all gods can. Uh, on the one hand, you can fear it, and on the other hand, you can uh, use it to chase your enemies away. Uh, many people use the atom bomb and the threat of an atomic war the way other people use universal communism. Uh, it just depends on who you're calling what. Uh, if you're bugged, say, by fluoridation you can claim that it's a communist plot. It's a communist. They're trying to weaken the moral fiber of the Americans by shooting fluorides into them. On the other hand, if you don't like that crowd that lives on the other side of Fifth Avenue, you can yell that they're warmongers. Uh, they're obviously mongering war by wearing those sunglasses and going to Sardis and uh, writing all those best-selling books, and that's obviously a warmongering crew. Now, you see, which is what? So I'm sitting there, and all these guys are sitting around on the ground, and I'm watching this. And this came immediately after a Mr. Clean commercial. Have you noticed that Mr. Clean is getting very, very, he's, he's a fuzz, rat thing, fuzz. He's wearing that hat all the time now, and, and they're, they're bringing the cops into this thing, and it's very bothering, you know. Have you noticed that? He's riding around with guns. He's got a Roscoe strapped on him now. Just a little side issue. And uh, kind of makes him more fun, though, in a way, you know. Uh, the next thing you know, he'll be chasing people over rooftops, uh, a la Naked City type, you know, people who aren't using Mr. Clean kind of thing and getting them. How many times have you seen a pigeon coat on a rooftop in a third-rate movie and a second-rate Naked City script? You know, where Marlon Brando or the Marlon Brando type is hiding behind the, the pigeon coat and he's shooting it out with a fuzz? I don't know. I've been on plenty of rooftops in New York, and I don't know of one pigeon coat. I've seen other things on rooftops. No, it's true. And, you know, all the years I've been in New York, I haven't seen anybody shoot it out on any roof. Uh, I've seen a little crap shooting on the roofs, but I've never seen any shooting it out on the roofs or even running down streets with guns drawn. But that's beside the point. I'm watching this scene, and these guys are all sitting around on the ground. And it's it, it could be the opening of a very serious camera three-type television show 
where the next thing you know, guys start talking like Hemingway, you know, or something like that. But it isn't. You know, these guys are just sitting around on the ground, and they they got a little fire going there, and they're all sitting, and they're all, ah, yeah, knock it off, stuff like that. And you see in the middle of them all is John Garfield with his hat all scrunched up and all the rest of them. And somebody says to Garfield, where are you from, Mac? And he looks at him. He says, I didn't ask you where you was from. The guy says, yeah, that's right. There's a momentary pause. And somebody third from the left says, you know, Mac, somebody's going to knock that chip off your shoulder one day. you got a chip on your shoulder. There's all kinds of guys like you around. And Garfield looks at him and says, you want to try it? He says, no. Well, that's very different. That wouldn't be done in today's movies. The guy would try it. He says, no, which is very close to life. He says, no. There's another pause. He says, but someday somebody's going to knock that chip off your shoulder, and it's going to knock your ears off, too. Garfield goes, eh. Well, you figure out, you know, right away you're in a Hemingway script, and these guys are very hard, serious, sensitive people. But it turns out they're just guys sitting around the ground. It turns out what they're doing is is waiting for a job. It has developed that this company has a sign out in front of it, the sign in which they are sitting in front of Men Wanted Tomorrow, three. And there are 75 guys sitting out in front of the place waiting for a job. Very, very anti any movie that would be done today. So they're waiting for a job. Now here's the point where it gets really... It shows, I think, the great thing about late movies is that if you look at them seriously you can see a tremendous change in moral attitudes that has come about in this country, for good or for ill. Just a tremendous change in moral attitudes. And especially individual attitudes, not necessarily group. And so here's John Garfield, and he's talking later on in the picture about ten minutes later. He's talking to a guy, and it turns out that Garfield has murdered a man. Now, Garfield, remember, has murdered a man. Now, automatically, think about this. Think about it the way we would write about the hero of a picture who has murdered a man. Now, think about it seriously. Come on now. Wouldn't it be, one, he's a sensitive person, and society has made him do this? <laughs> Isn't that true? That's the first, especially since he's out of work and is John Garfield. We would assume that, wouldn't we? Right. Let me tell you what he said. So he's sitting there, and the guy says to him, Pat O'Brien says to him, well, what'd you do it for? He says, well, this guy, you see, uh, he pulled a knife at me, he came at me. He's a wise guy, he came at me, and I belted him on the head with a, with a wrench. Killed him. Well, there's a brief moment there, and I thought, well, here's where it comes, you know. This is where immediately where we get the sensitivity bit. And it's this rat and crummy society that caused me. No, the guy came at me, I belted him on the head. So, uh... So Pat O'Brien says to him, well, what are you going to do? He says, well, I, I'm going to, I'm on a lamb. He says, well, you know, you got to go back. They're going to get you one day. Well, on a lamb. So <laughs> very, everything is there. He, he's doing exactly the way you would do it in life. You see what I'm trying to tell you? This is the way it happens. This is the way guys really do kill people. Somebody comes at him, you hit him on the head with a wrench, and he's dead. Well, society didn't do it. I'm sorry. The village voice did not make you do it. It was not the crummy editorial writers on the Daily News that did it. It wasn't the segregationists that Mobile that drove you into it. You hit him on the head because he was coming at you with a knife. And so he's on the lamb. Well, later on, and this is where we began to get really ripe with, with reality as opposed to what we would call reality today. So he's working in the oil fields, and he's still on the lamb all the way through, you see. And finally... He, we know he's on the land because the police, we see various shots of the police are checking all over. He's, he's, he's run away from Oklahoma. He's now down in Texas. And he's down there working away in the oil fields. And they keep bringing pictures of him to different oil fields looking for this guy. And finally, one day, it is obvious they're going to get him. So he decides to cut out. Well, a couple of minutes later, he's back at the oil field, at which through a plot complication, which we will not go into. He has to come back. Well, of course, they put, the, they put the finger on him. Here is the last scene in the movie. Now, we waited all the way through now until the end. They have got our hero. They have put, they, they've got him, you know, the fuzz. And not once is the fuzz considered bad. Not once are they, you know, uh, how we'd like to have the rotten southern sheriff. They hit him, all right, knock it off, you bum. We know you're kind, you know, and fooling with the evidence and doing the whole bit to put him in. No, they just say, sorry, son. 
and they put the they put the B on him. And the last scene, get this, this is the end of the movie. And me, as a as a typical 1962 type, I cannot tell you how cheated I felt. Here's the last scene in the movie. A train is coming. It's moving down the tracks. And, and, and we see Garfield now, and they got the clampers on him. He is standing there with the, uh, with the handcuffs, and the sheriff is standing next to him. And they're waiting for the train to take him back to Oklahoma. So Pat O'Brien is his boss, and Pat O'Brien is standing next to another guy, and the guy says to O'Brien, well, well, what are they going to do? He says, I don't know. He says, he killed the guy. He's got to go back. They've got him. There's another different thing right there. He says, I don't know. In life, you don't know what's going to happen. He says, I don't know. He says, well, aren't they going to let him go? He says, well, I don't know. It's up to the court. He killed the guy, you know. He killed this guy. <laughs> so there's a long pause, and, and, and uh, there's a, a quick shot to, to uh, John Garfield's face. And the chick says, I'm, I'm going to go with you, and I'm going to go where they're going to have the trial. And uh, he says, well, you know, you, you, you really, nobody knows how it's going to be. She says, but did you do it? He says, yeah, I killed this guy. And they got the clampers on him. They get on the train, and the train goes, and on the screen comes a great big sign that says, the end. How's that for a slice of realism? Not once did he look around and say, you made me do it. You did it, rotten society. You are rotten people. Not once. He says, well, I did it. Well, I'm sitting there, you know, and after that, the M&M commercial came on. And it was well into, it was well into the part, you know, where the girl takes her white glove and opens it up. And it says, what do you think she's got in the glove? And, and I, I knew what it was, you know, and I began to feel secure again. Because this was my world. I knew what she had in the glove, and I knew that the M&M would not melt and get her white glove all covered with sticky chocolate. I knew that, you see. And I felt that for just this one brief minute, the world had order, it had strength, it had beauty. More than that, it had composition by George. And, and right things were right, and bad things were bad. In that movie, I couldn't tell who was the villain. Should the guy fly? Well, he killed the guy. I don't know, you know. Was it society we were indicting? Well, society was in the ball game. He didn't. You know, he did it himself. He was on the lamb. I wanted him to tell me he was okay. They were going to let him go. It was okay to kill a guy. As long as you could hire on society. I wanted to... Well, you know, I'm sitting there, I'm waiting, and by George, it wasn't until that chick came out with those white gloves that I began to feel well. I know. Well, they let him go, sure. That's the real, they didn't show me, they let him go. I know that, I know that. It's okay. I know they're not going to fool me, I know. And furthermore, even though he didn't say it, he was a very sensitive guy, Garfield. In spite of the fact he swore and hollered and spit and kicked people, I know he was a very sensitive man. And, uh, well, you know. Hey, hey, cut it out. Cut it out. Speaking of sensitive people, this is WOR, AM and FM, New York. And uh, I don't know, you know, where it's where it, where it's all going to end. I, I can't tell where where it stops and where it doesn't start, and where it begins and where it starts again. It's like I'll tell you in in a, in a way. I remember one time to to show you. <laughs> <laughs> a peculiar sense of the changing time. There was the the only case I ever heard of when I was a kid of juvenile delinquency occurred three doors away. And this is a family which I have never talked about. A family named Bogash, which is a real good name for that neighborhood. And, and oh, yes, there were all kinds of people named Rokowski, Bogash, Nemet, Geza Nemet. Uh, do you know that at one point I spoke the worst pigeon Hungarian you ever heard in your life? Only out of self-defense, because this Hungarian lady would come down in the basement and hit me all the time. She hit indiscriminately all kids in the basement. Uh, that's the truth. And she would come screaming down. I don't know whether you know any Hungarians, but Hungarians are the screamingest people. The most, uh, they're, they're completely involved with screaming at one another. And I would go to, to Nima's house. And, of course, you see, I lived in various houses. When you're a kid, you don't really live in your own house, you know. 
You live in various houses, and you accept without question the mores of the house. Uh, you, you live in this. You're part of this thing. When you're a small enough kid, you see, up to a certain point, you don't do this. But after this point, you begin to accept one thing and divide it and put it into compartments. Well, at one point, I'm living in Nima's house. Like two afternoons a week, I'm completely a hunky. Uh, in the middle of the week, I would be a Polak. I'm over at Polis' house, and I spoke this rotten Polish because that's all they did, and they ate cabbage and played pinochle all the time at the Polak's house. Well, then about, oh, I'd say about four nights out of every ten, I am a Swede. And I'm, I'm in the kitchen with this lady who was a Laplander. And she would glower behind that stove and just look. Have you ever seen a Laplander? Do you know what they do in Lapland? Do you know that they hunt wolves with eagles? Oh, boy, picture that on the Grand Concourse when you talk about reality. And it develops a certain kind of person, and they're always up to their everything in snow. And they just stand and look. It, 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 uh, Lapland is literally the, it's, it's really the real life version of Lower Slavobia. Oh, yeah, so you know, Al Cap's land where it's always snowing and people are always trying to get away. Well, I'm living for about four days a week in this Lapland's house, this Laplander. And this woman would just stand back at the stove and you would see those blue eyes and that white face and that dark hair. And you could just hear her once in a while. She moans quietly. And looks. Well, I accepted that. That's the way people are in this house. And the old man, who was a Swede, a real Swede, because he drank like a fish, he would come reeling up and falling and yelling and screaming in Swedish up the back porch and fall into the door. And she would give him a great big, great big slice of anise bread. They had a thing. Yes, in, in Sweden, they believe if you eat enough anise bread, that that alcohol doesn't affect you. It's the anise that counteracts it. And he's downing the anise bread and drinking glug at the same time and yelling out in Sweden. And telling me in Swedish, ah, the kids are not like they used to be. Well, of course, that's true. Literally. Well, the next day, I'm in Nemeth's house. You want to hear about the, the Hungarians? Well, let me tell you about the Hungarians. I am always in the basement. Certain nationalities live most of their lives in the basement of their houses. Among them, Hungarians. Now, I'm in the basement with Geza Nemeth. Geza and Stefan Nemeth. And I'm in the basement, and here's what you'd hear upstairs all the time. You'd say, And there'd be a long pause, and Nemeth would look up from whatever he's making, his model airplane, and he would holler, And there'd be another pause, and then you'd hear coming downstairs, And I'm sitting there ducking down lower and lower, because this is always what happened. And the old lady grabs Nemeth and throws him behind the furnace, hits Stephen on the head with a mop, and lays around for the next kids, uh, us, you see, and they were diving, because she had like 19 of them. And she couldn't tell them apart anymore, and we were just, can you imagine visiting the mother of one of your friends, and she rips your shirt right off your back, belts you with a wet mop on the back of the head, and kicks you. This happened to me one afternoon at the Nemeth, and I didn't question it. I'm going to tell you, I didn't question it. And I went home, my shirt is torn off, and, and, you know, it's torn right off. She just grabbed me when I was going under a fence, ripped my shirt off, and I get home, and my, my mother says, What's the matter with the shirt? I said, Mrs. Nemeth tore it off, and she hit me. My mother, because she recognized that Mrs. Nemeth had only started what she should finish. And it was, it was a peculiar situation like this. Well, now, when you're living in various segmented societies of this kind, you begin to have an attitude or an appreciation of the segments themselves. And I, I don't believe for a minute that anybody living here in New York City, for that matter, has any real understanding of what, <laughs> of, of, of a genuine understanding, and certainly Thornton Wilder doesn't, I'm sorry, a real understanding of what it's like to stand in the main street in Marcellus, Michigan, with the wind blowing cool off the lake. And nothing more exciting has happened in the last year and a half in Marcellus than the thing with the girl there at that time in the school and the gym, that they're all talking about, and the three chickens that got run over last year by the Dodge. Well, now, <laughs> I want to tell you about the one great moment of true juvenile delinquency and how it's changed now, you know. There was this family named Bogosh who lived two or three doors away. Now, this was one of those temporary families that move in, and then they stay for a while, yell and scream and break a few windows and move out, you know, that kind of family in the neighborhood. Well, Bogosh moved in, and there were about five Bogashes, including... A, a daughter named Irene Bogosh. 
Well, Irene was roughly, I would say now looking at it, I would say she was probably 15. Although at that time, being at, at that moment, I was about 8. 50, she was a grown-up girl, you see, but she was really about 15. I figure Irene Bogash. And she was dark, very dark hair and white skin, and even to my untutored eye, a swinger, a lovely girl. Well, Irene Bogash would sit on the porch once in a while and look out while all of us are out in front of the house playing playing ball and stuff. And, and there were two or three other Bogashes involved were playing ball and having a big thing, one thing or another. Well, then one day, I'm home from school, and my mother and my father and a couple of people are in the kitchen talking about what happened to Irene Bogash. <laughs> And, and, and they're, they're talking away there, and I'm, I'm a kid. I'm trying to figure out what it is, you know, I'm trying to hear. And, and it turns out that they picked Irene Bogash up in the candy store. I couldn't, you know, picked Irene Bogash. We all went in the candy store from time to time, you know. But the way they said it, they picked her up in the candy store. It was a different kind of picking up in the candy store than we had ever had. Irene Bogash was picked up in the candy store. And I said, where, where, where's Irene? And my mother says she is not coming back for a while. Not coming back for a while. What happened to Irene Bogash? And then the dreaded word was out. Irene Bogash was sent to a mythical place which was always hanging over all of us in a peculiar, untouchable way, the reform school. Did they have a reform school when you were... Did you ever hear of the term reform school? Well, reform school... And Irene Bogash had been sitting on the porch all the time. She wasn't a window breaker or a yeller. She was sitting on the porch. Well, about 20 minutes later, about nine of us kids are back in the garage. And the word is out among all the kids that Irene Bogash is at the reform school. They took her to the reform school. That is like if in your particular, if you go to church, if the word gets out that one of the guys from the congregation has just been taken to hell... You know, yeah, what happened to Charlie? He's sitting there, well, you know, they came and got him. He's in hell now. Well, you know, that would really rock everybody. Everybody would, Jesus, you know, it really exists. Hell is really a place. Yes, Charlie, they came and got him. A guy with a red suit and horns came and got him the other day, dragged him out, kicking and screaming, out a pitchfork. You should have seen him. Marched him down the street, threw him in this black wagon, and it said hell on it. He's in hell now. Whew. Well, I'll tell you, the sermons would sound different then from that minute on. Well, Irene Bogash was in reform school, and none of us could figure out why, because we always thought in terms of kids that, you know, broke, stole things, kids that would steal a car, or kids that would fist fight. We could not understand why Irene Bogash was in reform school. Until three days later, I am in school. And these are, it's difficult to tell when you were actually inoculated with education when you learn something. We are out at recess, and one kid whom I knew came up to me and says, Hey, did you hear about Irene Bogash? She lives in your neighborhood, doesn't she? I says, Yeah. Did you hear what she was doing? I says, well, well, no. What, 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 what? Of course, I can't. You know, and immediately there's that sick feeling that you're going to hear something you shouldn't hear, and you can't stop from hearing it. I said, What? says, well, and of course, being a totally untutored kid, I said, no kidding, <laughs> for crying out loud, no kidding, really? Oh, boy, wow, we, wow, you know, I always figured it, wow, you know, whoa. I didn't have the slightest idea what he was talking about, and I suspect he didn't either because we were both in the same grade, but he had heard some older kids talking about this, what she was doing at the candy store. Well, I'm laughing about it. Oh, no kidding! Wow! That afternoon, I am home. I am sitting at the table. And not realizing the enormity of what I was about to say, I said, Hey, Ma, did you hear what Irene Bogash was doing? She turns from the stove and said, What? What, 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 what are you talking about? Because she knew very well what Irene Bogash... In fact, everybody in the neighborhood knew, but, what you know, eight-year-old kid... I said, well, buzz, 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 buzz. Isn't that funny, Ma? There is a long, fantastically pregnant moment. She said, where did you hear that? I said, but Jackie Melton told me. Who's Jackie Melton? 
I said, well, he's a kid in school. Right away I knew I've said it. I've said something just completely, insanely, wildly rotten. That, 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 you know, whatever Irene Bogash was doing, I shouldn't know anything about. And furthermore, I shouldn't laugh about it that knowing way, which I had. That, ha, 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 you know, they'll, oh, there we go. That, you know, that, ha, ha, they'll tag her. Well, you know, it was a funny bit. Apparently, she told my father about this. And that night, the old man is sitting there at dinner table. And he says to me, say, uh, did you know Irene Bogash very well? I knew this was a loaded question because the old man never asked me anything about the neighborhood unless it was loaded and it had grapes hanging all over it. And he says, did you know Irene Bogash? No! Which was the truth, absolute truth. He says, don't lie to me. I said, what do you mean? I said, why don't you and I go into the sun parlor after supper and talk about Irene Bogash, huh? You can tell me. I've been around. I've been around. <laughs> so about an hour later, I'm sick. I can't eat the red cabbage. Or the, you know, what am I going to say? And we're sitting in there on, on the day bed, and my father says to me, all right now. He closes the door. He says, look, your mother isn't going to know. I'm not going to say anything to your mother. She's not going to know. And I'm not going to tell Randy. This is just between us men. Now, remember, I've been around, and I've been a lot of places, and I'm not mad. Now tell me, where and when and how? Where, when, and how? I said, well, what, 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 what? He says, no, come on, come on, now don't get excited. Don't, don't get dull, hung up. Just take it easy now. Just take it easy. Just take it easy. It will never be mentioned again. Tell me about Irene Bogash. Well, well, Jimmy, Jackie Melton, he... Now, come on now. Now, don't lie on top of it. Just come across. <laughs> he said, where, when, and how? Just tell me. And that's all. That's all I want to know. I want you to just tell me about it. Just tell me. You don't even have to even go into detail. Just tell me where, when, and how. I didn't know what to do. Completely thrown. And I knew that I had to say something. And he was not, absolutely not believing anything I said. So I'm sitting there and I said, in the garage. Oh, okay. Whose garage? He said, my fellow Bruner's garage. Somehow it seemed terrible if I said our garage. I don't know why. I just said Bruner's garage. Because Bruner's garage was always open because Bruner once knocked the doors off on a Saturday night and you couldn't close them. So I said, Bruner's garage. He says, okay, when? Saturday. Saturday. When was it? What Saturday? Last, last Saturday. He says, okay, last Saturday. All right. Now, I'm not going to say anything about this. I'm not going to tell your mother, but I'm very glad you told me the truth. Yeah. He says, I'm very glad. And from now on, whenever you get into any kind of trouble like that, please come to me, will you? And please tell me the truth. Just come out right with it and just lay it on the line. And with that, the old man gets up, walks out of the front room, out of the front sun parlor, opens the door, goes into the kitchen picks up his newspaper, and starts reading about what the White Sox done. And I walk into the living room, I don't know what the devil has happened. All I know is that I did the right thing by saying in the garage on Saturday. And ever since that time, I've been just, every time I'm trapped, I holler Saturday in the garage. And everybody believes me, you know. And it's made everything work out much better. Now, I don't know what Irene Bogash was doing, even to this day. But it happened in the garage on Saturday. If anybody wants to check on a story, Bruner's Garage has still got no doors. And it all worked out. Oh, hell, Oh, what a love, what a love.
Very good. And let that be a lesson to all you kids. <laughs> the nature of reality is slippery. Very. Speaking of reality, we have with us tonight the limelight. And uh, if you haven't uh, gone down there and made the scene, I would suggest you do so. It's, uh, it's you know, it's a big place, and there's a lot of people sitting around. There was a very strange thing happened the other night. I'm sitting in the limelight, and a guy walks up to me who was, who was a listener type, and he had a funny look on his face. And he was an atomic physicist, believe it or not. He didn't say anything to me until later about it, and he says, I heard about it on the show. I said, what about it? He says, I don't think my wife would like it. <laughs> he looked around. He says, but I dig. And he was just sitting there. But it's a place. There's good food, and there's a good place to sit. And there's a fist fight breaks out occasionally. Guys play banjos. People holler. And there aren't many scenes made in the limelight, which uh, is refreshing for that square. <laughs> you have to explain that to her? Okay. Uh, it's the limelight, and it's at 91... 7th Avenue South, right in the heart of Sheridan Square. And uh, I suspect tonight I may go there after midnight. Do you want to make the scene down there? All right. Tonight after midnight. Any, any, anybody wants to come in for a fist fight, I'm ready tonight. After midnight it's the only time I make that scene. Now, uh, speaking of scenes, let's see. We have... Uh, hey, do you have that... that, that uh, we don't have that random ET, do we? Up. I am very curious about this. The other day, I, I saw Pfeiffer at a place, Jules Pfeiffer, and Pfeiffer says, he says, I hear, I hear Random House is going to put a spot on your show uh, about my book, Hold Me. And I said, yeah, I heard that. He says, they've got an E.T. And I says, how the devil do they sell a book, Pfeiffer, with an electrical transcription like they sell, you know, Mr. Clean? Uh, and he says, I don't know. He said, they made this E.T. I have not heard it. Let us listen to an E.T. selling a Pfeiffer book. Yeah. What is it? What is what? That. A book. How can it be a book? It's full of cartoons. It's a book by Pfeiffer. Oh, Who? For crying out the loud. cartoonist, Pfeiffer. Oh, oh a Pfeiffer. comic book. It's not a comic book. Pfeiffer, why don't you go after these guys with a flame Comic color. books are in color and cost a dime. This oh. is in black and white and costs a dollar ninety five. Oh, it must be an adult comic. Oh, come on, yeah. kill it! Oh, for crying out loud, please! Oh, yeah, hold me, comics. Oh, that's terrible. Comic. It's just called Hold Me. Oh, there come on. Is in there? I mean, is Mary Worth in there too? Steve Canyon? Oh, Beetle please, Bailey. come on! Hey, oh, this no. is getting Pfeiffer. Pfeiffer. Only it's Pfeiffer. up to my knickers. Come on! Oh, it's really quite funny. No. Uh, satirical. Satirical. Oh, stop it! Hey, hey, come from, on! Hey, uh, President Kennedy. Oh, sure, another Kennedy takeoff. And there's something marvelous here on the telephone company. And a classic. Hey, help! Sure, sure. I'm drowned in Pfeiffer. Yeah. No, honestly, it's very, uh, very, uh, here, take it. It's called Hold Me. Oh, I don't want it. You take it. No, I mean it. You take Help! it. You take it. I don't want it. You take Help! it. You take it. You take it. Ah! Oh, boy, we heard, didn't we? Well, that's, uh, Hold Me. <laughs> that's your favorite, whatever it is, where they sell these books. Random House. Let's see, uh... That's a funny bet. That's the first time I... How would... Can you imagine, uh... A one-minute spot selling the naked and the dead. You know? Uh, yeah, a one-minute spot uh, pushing Forever Amber. Or a one-minute spot pushing, let's say, uh, Kafka's The Trial. Really, think about that for a minute. Can you imagine a one-minute spot laying it out about Thomas Mann's The Magic Mountain? And uh, it's, it opens up with Hans Kastorp, you see. And Kastorp is sitting on a, on a park bench high in the Alps, and he's talking to this diabolical doctor who you suspect is the devil. And Kastorp says, Well, you see, I was coming up here, and I was visiting a friend of mine, you know, who had tuberculosis. And I was sitting there with him, and we was talking about how terrible it is to have tuberculosis, when all of a sudden I feel I have inside of me a fever. Well, they take the test, and the next thing you know, I'm sitting here. I'm up in this mountain looking down all the time. <laughs> well, let me tell you, you are here for a purpose. Far, far more and beyond any purpose to cure any small lesions which you have in the lungs. Uh, would you like to talk today about good and evil? 
Yes, friends, this wonderful book, which explains all those various problems of good and evil, is called The Magic Mountain, written by that wonderful new German author, Thomas Mann. Ask for it at your favorite bookstore. Good and evil, which shall win? Which side do you stand on? These and other fascinating problems are developed. Cut it out there. We'll have no religion tonight at this hour. It scares people. And we also have with us, uh, let's see, uh, the Mandarin House. And uh, they're a place where they sell all this Mandarin food. And I would suggest that you look up Mandarin. That is a great word to look up in the dictionary. Uh, <laughs> it has very, very funny connotations, but the food is, is superb. And it's down on 13th Street between 6th and 7th in the village. And they have a little barzy there. And they have the... I, I just have to say this. It's a very embarrassing thing for me to have to admit. But they have the most insanely... I hope Emily Quote is not here this because while Emily is sitting at a table talking to me, I cannot help but allow all this to ha happen within me. Because you see, after all, I am but merely human. Hence, I am made of the poor common clay that washes away in the springtime. I'm sitting there noticing that not only do they have Mandarin food, they have the most insane, the most insanely, wildly exotic waitresses I have ever seen in my life, right? You can't believe it. And nobody notices it there, which makes it even more spooky. You talk about the bunny clubs. Wow, we... <laughs> you know, uh, speaking of bunny clubs, and I'm not going to go into Pfeiffer's and uh, that whole the whole thing here now. Did you? I, I, I I'm going to have to ask her for this one time. You know, it's a funny thing. I I've been watching this growth of uh, so-called uh, gospel music for some time, and the uh, pseudo folk music for some time too. And I can remember, oh, yeah, let's get the show magazine out of the way, too, okay? All right, Ted. Show magazine, speaking of bunnies, they got this thing about bunnies <laughs> in the show magazine that's now on sale at your newsstand. They also exposed Japan for what a rotten mess it is. That's uh, this week's show. Well, now, uh, do you know that they've got a club here in town? This is for you outlanders who do not know of the strange social mores that are extant in New York. Do you know that there's a club here in town now that specializes in gospel music? A nightclub. It specializes in gospel music, yes, and you know what they call it? You would not... I mean, they call it the new gospel tabernacle called the Sweet Chariot. <laughs> now, wait, you haven't heard the rest of it. Now, wait a minute. You haven't heard the rest of it. Now, they, they've got a liquor license, too, you see, and it's dimly lighted, and, of course, it's wildly sensual. People are yelling and screaming and patting their hands and yelling and kicking around and screaming. And all the waitresses, get this now, are dressed in white tunics that have white wings on the back. <laughs> they are heavenly messengers, and they come bearing Hennessy. And, 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 and all the while, up on the stage, they're belting it out. Over that old, over that old, that old river Jordan. Over that old, over that old, over that old, old Jordan. Over that old, 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 old river Jordan. I want you to know Isaac Wyan. Hold it there. Now you're all hung up, Betty. Now cut it out. Cut it out. Cut. Now, now there is 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 something that will probably be documented when the when the future Gibbon arrives on the scene. I'm sure that when when Rome was slowly sinking into the mire, they must have had some version of a nightclub where they had these gigantic orgies, and all the chicks who were involved were dressed like oh Aphrodite. <laughs> there must have been some showing up on the scene dressed like Diana. Others were dressed like. Uh, Probably even, if I know anything about Rome, Apollo. Uh, there's, a, there's a very good possibility that a few of the chicks showed up that way, too. However, I think this, uh, this extension of the bunny sequence is only logical. Because the idea of a bunny, you see, a bunny is not a rabbit, you know. 
It, a bunny does not carry the connotations that rabbits carry. You're aware of that. You're not? You see, because if, if anybody ever referred to one of the girls as one of the rabbit waitresses, that's a very different connotation than bunny. Think about it for a minute. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes, you see. Uh, it's, 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 uh, it's all part of a, of a very interesting twist that has come about that relates morality to age. If a guy is shown on a screen as a 52-year-old gunman and he guns down a lot of people, He's a rotten gangster. If he's a 21-year-old gunman and he shoots a lot of people down, he's a, he's a wonderful, misunderstood, sensitive uh, victim of society. You see the difference there? You could not, you could imagine George Raft as being rotten. Tony Perkins is only sick and confused. <laughs> and yet, all the while, their victims lie there bleeding. Blood is blood is blood is blood is blood is blood. It depends on whose grandmother is shot, I suppose, as to how you view morality. So is a bunny as bad as a rabbit? Is a bunny a rabbit? Is a waitress who wears a pair of white wings on the back, is she Lolita? Is Lolita in the same boat, let us say, as... Uh, no, it gets, it gets, uh, you see, you get into the circle there. It's like the maelstrom. It's, it's the maelstrom. When does a, when does a, when does a hard hitting, angry comic become a dirty old man? <laughs> Interesting problem there. Fascinating. When does, <laughs> when does a hip, when does, when does a hip become a bum? It's an interesting problem, just a little, little, little problem that's all tied up. You know, there's a lot of things that are all tied up together here. You, you, and and, and you, you know then, for example, in, in almost every American movie, love is never possible between anybody over 25, or at least admittedly over 25, because it involves something other than that great momentary, wonderful, deeply sensitive passion of two souls for each and the other. I suspect that the next great movie about love will, will have as its basis the love of a seven-year-old for a nine-year-old. Oh, yes. Yeah. Totally asexual, completely antiseptic, but thoroughly passionate and beautiful. That's all, by the way, all the way in caps. Everything has to be in capital letters here in our time. Keep your knees loose, Dad. And be careful. When does greasy kid stuff just get to be greased?